Our next speaker is Melissa Chang. Melissa started with a bachelor's in elementary school education, but has turned it around because the ocean called a little louder. She has accumulated experience as an aquarist at several aquariums throughout Southern California, including the Birch Aquarium at Scripps, just up the road from here. Coming into the program with a background in stock restoration, and taking care of fish, and managing their life support systems, I think Melissa knew that she wanted to work on something related to husbandry uh, or aquaculture. And this project allowed her to do just that, an incredibly important topic. She designed a complicated, ambitious project that is relevant and important, and designed and executed an experiment that was complicated, and I suspect at some points it was frustrating. But through this process, she exhibited adaptability, perseverance, and incredible talent and skill, and we're proud that she was able to do this project here at Scripps in the program. The name of her presentation is Go Mad for Gonads. Does exposure to levangestrel affect the reproductive system of the California warty sea cucumber, Apostichopus parvimensis? That one I practiced. I did not practice the synthetic hormone. Thank you, Melissa. So, as Samantha mentioned, I designed an experiment that was meant to test whether or not exposure to levonorgestrel would affect the development of gonads inside the warty sea cucumber. If you're unfamiliar with the compound, this is what it looks like. Probably still not familiar with the compound. <laughs> you might be more familiar, though, with this specific packaging. Levonorgestrel is a synthetic progestion that's often found in emergency contraceptives like this, as well as in regular birth control and hormone replacement therapy. In individuals with uteruses, uteri, levonorgestrel prevents the release of eggs from the ovaries. Like other steroids and hormones in its class, it does not dissolve in water and has a tendency to absorb into the sediment, which then becomes a point of concern when you're thinking of our environment but how does it get there? Through the pipes, mostly. So once you take levonorgestrel, that 1.5 milligram concentration pill, it goes into your body. Your body absorbs about 23%, which means the 77 remainder is flushed down the toilet, makes its way to a wastewater treatment facility, where most of it gets pulled out, but small quantities still enter the environment. And even though these quantities might be small, might be tiny, they do have huge implications for the marine life that lives inside of it. In a study in 2018 on marine fish, they found that female fish lost abilities in their, vi their viability, fertility, and fecundity, and that male fish start to exhibit signs of decreased synthesis of estrogens, which are important later on the line in reproduction and spawning. In marine amphipods, or small crustacean, planktonic crustacean, they found that survivability in total decreased when exposed to high concentrations of levonorgestrel. My concern then became, how does exposure to this compound in Southern California affect our coastal marine life? Specifically in the sea cucumber. Around the world, sea cucumbers are known for being bioturbiters and key components and engineers in biodiversity. Specifically, in tro tropical reefs, for example, they'll overturn the nutrients, which help corals grow a lot better. And in coastal communities like ours over here, they'll help stabilize oxygen levels, even in warm water events like El Nino, which tend to take oxygen out of the water. For my project in particular, we looked at, or I looked at rather, the warty sea cucumber which is a local organism to our coastline and one that I've found very dear in my heart now. <laughs> <laughs> so sea cucumber in general, to backtrack a little bit, has a role in not only being ecologically important, but also being economically important as a fisheries species of interest. It's typically caught by hand in dive fisheries and then brought to the surface where it gets boiled, then dried, 
and then in this drying process loses a substantial amount of water weight. So if you think about when you go in the jacuzzi, you get all wrinkly, and then you go and get that nice sunbathed tan, and you lose all the water in your body, think about that, but on a much smaller slash larger scale. So the popularity with sea cucumbers, at least currently and in the past, has been primarily in Asian markets, not just as a cuisine item in gourmet food, but also in traditional medicine where they're thought to believe, where they're believed to be cures for fatigue, constipation, joint pain, and if you hadn't guessed by the phallic appearance, impotence. <laughs> right now, the cucumbers in these markets are skyrocketing to the point where international waters are also facing a common threat as Asian local stocks have. Asian local stocks have been significantly depleted and thus, again, that demand in international markets grows, those ones deplete, and then prices increase. Today, depending on the species, a half pound of dried sea cucumber can sell for as much as $110. This is just a half pound. The lightened load of this boiled and dry bechamel trade of sea cucumbers can carry a heavy environmental burden and lead to overharvesting in global fisheries. California is not exempt from this trend, even with all the nice regulations we have in place. Here in 2011, specifically, uh, okay, where that gold line over there gets higher than the gray line, you can see that this fishery went from being a high harvest to a low, with a low profit to being a fishery where you could still get a harvest even as your stocks or your landings were declining. When you see, start to see this rise in popularity and that relative high increase in value for a low catch rate while participation over here on the bars remains relatively stable, you start to wonder and really think like, okay, well, what's happening to this fishery? Is it doing okay? Do we need to do anything to make it better? And so for the Wardy California, Wardy Sea Cucumber Fishery in California, we have some regulations in place, specifically a limited number of participation permits for fishing vessels in the dive fishery, as well as closures seasonally for the sea cucumber to be able to recover and spawn. Having time relevant data is important when strategizing regulations for fisheries. And despite its economical and ecological importance, the warty sea cucumber is considered a data poor species. Currently, we have information on how its method of reproduction occurs. Over the course of a whole year, it'll go through an entire process of absorbing its gonads and then repopulating it. Then broadcast sperms and eggs into the water for external fertilization. So what happens then when you add a pollutant that disrupts the typical endocrine system activities involved? With my capstone project, I wanted to explore the gap in how warty sea cucumber reproduction was affected by exposure to levonorgestrel. Synthetic progestions like levonorgestrel are understudied in comparison to others like synthetic estrogens, which you've probably heard more about from people like Alex Jones thinking the frogs are turning gay from it, but have a comparably rate, similar rate of occurrence in entering our oceans. Our humans, as humans grow more concerned with their reproductive health, the amount of levonorgestrel entering the marine environment will only increase. And by studying the effects of this compound on the warty sea cucumber, I could make observations on interactions between pollution and development in this epibenthic invertebrate, while also increasing knowledge availability of unintended biological impacts of leaf nergestral. Specifically, I went to test the hypothesis that exposure to this compound would lead to a thickening of the gonad membrane, and thus inhibiting the release capability for eggs and sperm. To this, test this hypothesis, I set up an experiment using three tanks. Each tank was given the same treatment, five specimens, ambient filtered seawater, food, airlines for oxygen, one inch sand bed, and 10% water changes every two days in a closed system. The only difference in the tank setup for all of them was the amount of levonorgestrel they received. In one tank, which we'll call the control, they received zero levonorgestrel. In the lower, in the lower dose tank that we have as an intermediate step, it reflected what you would find more on the higher spectrum in the environment or entering the environment. And for the higher dose tank, the third tank, 
reflected an amount necessary for current analytes to be able to be processed and actually visualized for this specific compound. At the beginning, middle, and end of this experiment, which occurred over the course of 37 days, I took biopsies of the sea cucumber gonads using a combination of a needle and syringe to pull out pieces out from the body cavity, and when that didn't work, scalpel knives, they're always really helpful. You take a little, you take a little piece, you pick, stick it inside, you pull up a little bit of gonad, you snip it off, and then you put it under the microscope for further inspection. At the end of the experiment, I took those biopsy samples at the last round of biopsies and put them under histology staining for better time lapse or time specific frame imaging. Individuals were separated into tanks based off of a ratio of about two males to three females, which, you know, when you start taking biopsies comes really in handy because as you can tell, there's not very much difference in exterior appearance for you to be able to tell what gender it is. Um, let's see. And once you do, though, get those gonads, you can start looking a little bit down deeper. So here are these magnified, well, the pictures were magnified at one and a half or one and a quarter, but now they're much, much larger here. <laughs> Mango orangey on top, mango orange jelly, that are your, those are your eggs, your ovaries. Down here, that creamy white are your testes. When you start getting even further down though, they start to look more like this. And please do note the scale bar in black on the bottom showing that these eggs are much, much larger than the sperm on the, your, le your right, my left. All right, so every time I went to do a biopsy, I had to make sure that I was still looking at the right organism, so I'd sex them every time, trying to look for these items, objects. And then in the last bit of the histology portion, stained in blue over here on your left are ovaries, and on the right and brown are the testes. You'll notice the missing low-dose version for the ovaries, and that's because I encountered a few problems, which we will go over in just a moment. In terms of results, after taking measurements of the outer membrane, which was the point of my hypothesis testing, I found that there was not, no difference. That, mean, that meant that during this entire 37-day trial, I had to accept the null hypothesis that gonad membrane development was not affected by exposure to leafnergestrel. So the timeline I had for this experiment lent a hand in being able, unable to reject the null hypothesis. What do you see cucumber gonads develop over the course of several months, as I mentioned before, before the spawning season, and my experiment started in the mid to late period of gonadal development. Other confounding variables that might have led to the results I saw included unexpected behaviors by the cucumbers themselves. For example, just chilling at the top the entire time, not on the sediment at all, where you'd expect all the compound to go to, and so, you know, just up there having fun. And with some premature evisceration in a low dose tank, which skewed my ability to make comparisons between the different levels of development across all sexes and all tanks. If I were able to do this experiment again, I'd extend the duration of the aquarium experiment, add more cucumbers, change the contaminant loads, and to better mimic what would occur outside the laboratory and start on earlier in the gonad development for the sea cucumber stock. So I learned a lot through this experiment, and while I didn't find the result I was looking for, I did find something I wouldn't have expected. Uh, this unidentified elliptical body, which I found in every gonad of all the species or all the individuals that I took samples from. And with the experienced eyes of Dr. Nick Holland, I was able to find out that this an identified elliptical body, which I thought was just eggs, because, I mean, look, it looks like eggs, <laughs> was actually a parasite. And that this parasite is related to the same ones that cause malaria in humans. So your next question might be then, does this mean that warty sea cucumbers can contract malaria? Probably not. 
um, for many reasons, mostly because it's just a relative, not actually the malaria-causing agent, but it is something I'm interested in learning more about and will be learning more about during the summer while we're all doing the rest of our course load. Uh, I'd like to take a few more seconds just to acknowledge and thank my capstone committee, my chair, Dr. Greg Rouse, who will be doing closing statements, Dr. Teresa Talley, Bill Zorowski, Samantha Murray for all of her encouragement throughout this process, uh, Dr. Nick Holland for giving me a crash course in histology staining and viticulture, <laughs> and the Mass MBC 2021 cohort, which really helped keep my sanity as I went mad for gonads. <laughs> Hi, great job. Um, I remember you mentioning there was something else special about the parasite besides that it's related to malaria. Will you talk more about that? Sure. So this parasite also, um, earlier on in its ancestral life, started out as a autotroph, so photosynthetic, photosynthesizing agent, which is really weird when you think of a parasite because you just usually think of, you know, some little monster inside of you trying to eat everything out. But yeah, but it actually started out as a plant-based it's pretty interesting. Okay. Hi, Melissa. Great job. Uh, my question for you is you talked about levonorgestrel. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Um, <laughs> but it's not, the, it's not a, a, a typical hormone that's used in other birth control methods or something you said. Has there been a study that's, that shows if gonads have been affected by that in sea cucumbers, the other agents? So I haven't found information on sea cucumbers being affected by them specifically, which is a lot of the driving force and motivation for me to see it fit did in these. Echinoderms in general, like the sea cucumber, have been used as bioindicators in the past for other contaminants and pollutants, like heavy metals or other endocrine disrupting agents. And so I thought it would be very interesting to see if this could also be one way we could do it instead of trying to find the analyte through, like, mass spectrometry, mass spectrophotometry, because it has proven to not be as efficient at finding those lower dose concentrations that would be more relevant to what's in the environment. And we have a question from the web from Anana Meows, which I kind of love and wanted to say out loud. I know who that is. <laughs> Could you explain or describe what premature evisceration is? And what other bioindicators could test for these hormone levels and be as effective besides sea cucumbers? All right. So for the first part of the question, um, could you, sorry, one more time. There's the first part. What is premature evisceration? Right. So with sea cucumbers, they do have an annual evisceration event. So after they spawn, they will let everything go. But if they get too stressed, for example, if you poke them too much while you're trying to measure them or take biopsies, all of a sudden it'll go from being super, super compact and contracted to going into jelly mode or flaccid if you want. And then all the guts come out on the end. And so it's premature for my experiment relatively because I didn't want that to happen until after everything was done. <laughs> And for the second part, other bioindicators. So currently, a lot more research has been put into freshwater species. They're a little bit easier to track, tend to have a higher um, birth rate. So one species that they're using more typically has been zebrafish and fathead minnows, which are a little bit, again, easier to track and have differences in appearances externally. So you can tell the male and female apart. So if the female starts to develop secondary male characteristics, you're like, oh. That's not a good thing. Great. Right. And, and one final question. Oh, was there another question in the audience? No. no. Okay. <laughs> uh, from Dane, has there been much research into the routes that these chemicals take to get into our waterways? For levonorgestrel specifically, no. Not in California, at least. They have seen and tried to do some studies, but the most recent one in 2000. 15 only mentioned briefly that they found it coming in through or out of the effluent of waters. In terms of other countries though, like France, Spain, and China, they found that it's not only coming out through 
wastewater effluent, but also have been monitoring it coming through stormwater surges. So, or not surges, stormwater flooding. So taking the water samples from there and getting the contaminant measures from that. 